So I have to uh, explain that this is very experimental and also very much a response to um, what I learnt from the discussions that we were able to have yesterday. So for those of you who weren't there, it may seem a little odd, so if I can just explain that to begin with. What I want to do are three things. What um, the, the workshop yesterday challenged me to think was, and if I can put it most provocatively, um, it made me think that looking for subjectivity, um, it may not always be most productive to look at what the person writes. In other words, it, may, it made me think about the limitations of building up a picture of someone's subjectivity from ego documents as if they were discourses. So what I want to do is just to suggest, um, since there are seven sacraments, seven um, different ways that one might use documents to explore subjectivity without reading them as discourses. Um, does that make sense? Sorry, it sounds a bit weird, but it, I hope it will make sense. Second, I wanted to talk a little bit about what theoretical frames we use to talk about subjectivity, and here I'll talk very briefly about my own use of psychoanalytic ideas. And then thirdly, I wanted to talk about how we think about group subjectivity, because as Laura said, that's the challenge I now face. Having worked on an individual, I'm now moving to work on the peasant's wall, which is thousands of people. So um, I wanted to start by thinking about a mistake. And it's a very interesting mistake that Luther makes. And he's writing to, um, this is at a point when Luther looks not like <coughs> that, but like this. <laughs> um, so thin, gaunt, imagine, obsessive monk. Uh, and he writes to his confessor, who looks like this. <laughs> Wouldn't you want this guy as your confessor? <laughs> very comforting, a uh, warm, round face. And what this letter is about, and it's in 1519, and in it, to Staupitz, Luther says, I feel you are leaving me too much. I feel, in the words of, a psalm, of the psalm, like a child weaned from its mother. And I worked on this for a long time, found the reference to Psalm 131, um, but what is very interesting is that in all the modern translations of Psalm 131 and in the King James Bible, it goes, um, Surely I have behaved and quieted myself as a child that is weaned of his mother. My soul is even as a weaned child. So in the King James's version and every other version I know, the weaning is done by the child. And it's about establishing independence from the mother. But Luther is using it the other way round. He feels like a child that is weaned from its mother, that's separated and abandoned and left. So then I looked at how he translates it in 1534. And I'll just read out the German because I know there are some German, um, <coughs> some people here who will understand it. Um, and, but I don't fully. He writes, Wenn ich meine Seele nicht setzet und stillet, so ward meine Seele entwehnet, wie einer von seiner Mutter entwehnet wird. It's a highly complex sentence, much more complex than Luther usually uses in his translation. And what he's getting at is if I were not able to still and calm my soul, then my soul would have become weaned like a child is weaned from its mother. So he still has it around the wrong way. And I found that mistake really fascinating because it suggested the sense of his loss and his separation from his confessor, who isn't writing back to him. And we had lots of examples of people using strategies to get other people to write back to them. And this is his, one of his strategies. And um, it shows what a huge thing it's going to be for him not only to lose his confessor, 
but to lose his relationship to the mother church. So that's just an example of a mistake. It's not a straightforward discourse that Luther is giving. It's what you might work out about what mistakes and slips sometimes reveals. So that's example number one. The second thing, and I know that there were people at the workshop who work on humor, and humor seems to me really interesting. What kind of sense of humor an individual has? What kind of jokes that they make? And Luther loves to make jokes. Um, you might not always find his jokes funny, um, but he goes on and on um, making jokes. And one thing he adores doing is making puns. So um, when in 1530, so now we're going back to the Luther look, that looks like this, um, when he is, <coughs> um, sorry, just get to where I want to be. When he is in, uh, in 1530, um, there was the Diet of Augsburg where the Confession of Augsburg was presented. And this is the document that establishes the Lutheran Church as an independent body. And it's, uh, it's put forward to Charles V at the Diet of Augsburg in 1530. So a huge historical moment. And um, everybody uh, is in um, Augsburg. Um, they're all kind of um, hanging out there. But Luther can't be there. He's stuck back here in this castle in Coburg, and he's lonely and grumpy. So what he does is he imagines what's going on at Augsburg, where the Diet is, and where um, everybody else is involved in all kinds of hustle and bustle. And he writes a letter in which he makes this wonderful joke that um, it's like a parliament of jackdaws. And they're all black. And of course, black is the elite color. So many of the people at the Diet would have been wearing um, black. And you can see down the bottom, here are some councillors or patricians wearing black. So he says, well, they're just like jackdaws. Um, and uh, then he starts making um, puns on jackdaw. And he's got monedula, and he puns in Latin, and he does a whole series of verbal trans um, uh, transformations between Latin and German, and um, ends up with an uh, making an equivalence between jackdaw and edelman. So it's monedula to edelman, which means nobleman. So he does this whole kind of riff in the course of um, a letter. And why I think that's really interesting is it gives you a, an insight into Luther's subjectivity as someone who loves transformations, loves playing with words, loves making one thing into another. And um, I think that's a really interesting <coughs> aspect of someone's um, subjectivity. And that takes me to the third one, and that is repetitions. What is it that someone keeps repeating, keeps using um, as, a, as an image? What does that tell you about their structures of thought? And one of the other things that I think is related to Luther's ability to make puns is his ability to coin a nickname. Uh, it was a, it's a devastating talent. Um, and nicknames are, are wonderful, and one could go on and on about them. But um, for example, he has an antagonist who's called Cochleus, um, and I haven't got a picture of him, unfortunately, but um, I can show you. Um, uh, uh, I'll come on to those in a minute. So Cochleus um, can mean snail. It can mean spoon. Um, and it can also, if it means snail, you can see that it can mean female sexual organ. So what he does with that is he um, just goes to town on Cochleus. He calls him Spoon Man. He calls him Snail. And Snail is a very apt insult because Cochleus spent his entire time, and his entire life, in fact, attacking Luther. And he was always a couple of steps behind. So Luther would come up with one heresy, and then Cochleus would spend hours um, refuting that. And then before he knew it, there's some, another um, uh, heresy has appeared, and he has to refute that. 
And so Cochleus is always following Luther um, just a bit behind, trying to catch up and uh, refute him. So abusing him in this way um, is very, very powerful. And Luther ends up calling him a, a man in skirts, again, getting at this other meaning of, um, of uh, Cochleus. It's also like the inner ear, and he makes fun of that too. So it's, again, it's the same ability to play, um, but to use it in a really um, destructive manner against your opponents. And what he also does is in the very early years, his first opponents um, all get animal representations, uh, and he gives them nicknames that are to do uh, with animals. And I think names and the talent for naming something is also connected to one of Luther's biggest intellectual gifts. He's someone who can name, put a name on something that's very complex and simplify it. And that is a very interesting intellectual gift because if you can do that, you can simplify and you provide a word which other people can then use in a really devastating way because you've named something that is otherwise hard to name, hard to get hold of, and hard to discuss. So this talent for nicknames is also linked, I think, to one of Luther's very deep um, talents, and that is the ability um, to name. And it goes back to one of his first insights, which is when he calls, when he names the Pope the Antichrist. And that is a, a, a very powerful polemical move. And it's one that then becomes part of Protestant propaganda from then on, the idea that the Pope um, is the Antichrist. And again, um, we can see how it's linked with nicknames. Um, some of you may know this, the, uh, the papal ass. This is a creature that was pulled out of the Tiber in 1496 um, and is meant to be an image of the papacy. So that's why in the background you can see Castel Sant'Angelo. And in one of his later treatises, Luther condemns the Pope as the Asphalt Pope. And the Asphalt Pope is a wonderful name because it picks up on this early Reformation polemical triumph. And the idea that he's just an asphalt pope and that his decrees are asphalts, they're, they're um, papal um, uh, drecatals, they're papal dirtals, he says. They're not decretals, they're drecatals. Um, so another of these puns that he uses. And I think that ability to pun and to name, to name an antagonist and then by calling him the Antichrist, invoke a whole apocalyptic understanding of what's going on in the Reformation is hugely powerful, but it also feeds into his ability to come up with simple theological ideas like sola fide, sola um, uh, salvation through faith alone. Um, and, and that ability to name complex theological ideas is very important. <coughs> Fourthly, I think what's interesting too can be what someone doesn't say. Um, and this is not a very good example of that, but one um, thing that I've been working on recently is Luther's anti-Semitism. And it's a very interesting variety of anti-Semitism because whereas medieval anti-Semitism is often closely linked to um, uh, a, a deep respect for Mary, and a hatred of the Jews as those who deny Mary's virginity and Mary's special status. In Luther's case, there isn't very much about that, although there is some, but there's not so much. There's nothing about Jews poisoning wells, but there is lots and lots and lots about circumcision. So for Luther, the fact that the Jews are circumcised and that they are proud of circumcision is the thing that just Luther goes on and on and on about, attacking this, saying they shouldn't be proud of their circumcision, etc., etc., etc. And once you look at what he doesn't say, and also what he does say, I think you get a different um, understanding of the nature of that anti-Semitism. <coughs> 
And fifthly, and here I come back to something that Laura said at the very outset, the need to overcome dualism between mind and body. And that was something that came up again and again, I thought, in the workshop, but something that in the session I was in, we didn't really um, develop and discuss. Um, and here, um, obviously, lots of people have thought about this much more than I have. But in relation to Luther, I think it's really important that Luther is ill most of the time, especially after 1530. And from 1530 onwards, he has pretty much constant headache. Um, and so he keeps a vein in his leg open, uses a pumice stone to keep it open, because if you have an open wound, then the noxious humours can come, yeah, ugh, can come out of your head and uh, that they go out through the leg rather than going up into your, into your head. And I think illness uh, is very important to how we think about someone's subjectivity. Uh, and it's really important to bring body and mind together. And also um, in connection with that, sixthly, um, is thinking about travel, how somebody gets to somewhere else. And in Luther's case, when in the early years he's going to uh, defend his views at Augsburg or he's going to Heidelberg to talk to his order, he gets there <clears throat> largely by walking. And I think it's really interesting to think about what would that process of walking have been like? How long would it take? What would he have experienced? I'm convinced he didn't walk all the way because I just don't think he could have walked that fast. Um, so partly he must be hitching lifts. How do you do that? What does it mean? And also very interesting about Luther is that he was hopeless at horse riding. And again, I think that's very important to your subjectivity. If you can't ride a horse, um, that's what nobles do. And if you can't do that, it's a big um, part of your subjectivity and the ways in which you can be um, a man. So that's um, six, and connected with that is something that we did talk about, which is landscapes. Um, although we didn't talk about the sea, and I still feel bad about the person who in the initial session talked about coming from Portsmouth and the fact that we're in Brighton. Um, so that made me think about the importance of landscape on where someone feels at home, also in relation to their subjectivity. It's different for me. I think in Oxford, I'm the furthest I can be from the sea in this country. So that, that can be quite important to subjectivity. Seventh, um, this was something that we talked about quite a lot, so I won't say much about that, and that's dreams and how historians can use dreams. And I think dreams are really interesting um, because they're a different, they're not a, they're not a discourse, I think, because um, the way in which a dream is expressed is, is, um, is and what a dream experience is, is not the same as a conscious kind of um, linguistic uh, outpouring. And Luther has some very interesting dreams, um, including um, one that he has uh, while he's here. Um, uh, and it's about a cat, um, about an eagle who gets turned into a cat, and the cat gets put in the sack. And it's, sorry, I'll have to go back a bit. It's not Luther's dream, it's Melanchthon's <coughs> dream. And Melanchthon is his co-worker. So Melanchthon is in Augsburg, and Luther is in Coburg. And Melanchthon's dream has an eagle being turned into a cat who gets put into a sack, and then Luther appears and says, let the cat out of the sack. And what is fascinating is that um, all the reformers talk about this. They write about it in their letters, and they come up with different interpretations of what that dream means. And you can guess what the interpretations are likely to be. If it's an eagle, looks like it's going to be something to do with the emperor. But each different interpretation is also a different emotional assessment of what is going on in the diet. Um, so it's very interesting because what I'm suggesting is that one can use dreams not just to talk about an individual's psychology, 
not just to put them in the context of the time and say, well, they had dream books, um, they could have looked it up and they could have worked out what the dream meant that way around. I don't think as historians that we have to stop there. And I think one of the things we can do is look at their own rival interpretations as well as what the dream may have meant to the individual who had um, the dreams. So what kind of um, uh, frameworks do we use? The one that I used was um, a sort of vague version of some psychoanalytic ideas. And interestingly, one of the criticisms of the biography was that I'd created a simple account of Luther, who suffered from a father complex. What I'd done was a rehash of Eric Erickson's work about young man Luther, uh, and that everything was, could be derived from Luther's relationship um, to his father. Um, and I think um, my own view would be that that's a, an unfair reading of it, um, although I can see why you might uh, uh, want to criticise the book that way. I certainly think that you can't avoid Luther's relationship with his father, and I think that Luther understands the fatherhood of God and God's um, distance from us, his absolute power, I think he understands that in a very particular way because of the conflict that he had with his father. But I think that when psychoanalysis becomes a character outline like that, it is not helpful and it is not interesting. And what I find interesting, which is why I went um, through all those different those different ways of using source material. What I find interesting is the process. It's the kinds of um, intellectual and emotional um, moves that someone makes that you can work out by looking at how they write and think. And that a, an individual is immensely complex. Luther is someone who's profoundly musical and who has an ability to play. Um, which is also connected with his anal side, but which I would never want to pathologise and reduce um, and present him as an anal personality. So I think there's a lot that we can learn from psychoanalytic ideas, but they always need to be in close tension uh, with the material itself, and it's the way that it helps us see what might be going on in a source um, that I find uh, interesting. And finally, in one minute... Group subjectivity. This is the challenge that I now face. How do you explain a revolutionary psychology? And I think that's what I have to explain with the German Peasants' War. And I think that psychology or um, subjectivity of a group is central to understanding the Peasants' War. This is the biggest revolution in Western Europe before the French Revolution. And the peasants are in control for three months. And they're making huge personal sacrifices to do this. They're putting absolutely everything on the line. And I think we really need to think about revolutionary psychologies, how they arise, what they consist in, how they work and how they're transmitted to other people. How do you get other people to join? And that's a huge technical problem if you're a peasant and you're living in a society which doesn't have quick and reliable means of communication. That itself is amazing. And our evidence from it is always indirect. It's either trials that happened later or it's other people's accounts, their reports of what happened. So that much of our evidence has to be not what people say, but what it is that people do. And that's really what I'm wanting to suggest through uh, about thinking about subjectivity. I think we need to think much more about what people do and not just what they write. So the sort of things that I want to look at is what do they attack? Why do they attack convents so much? Why do they attack castles? What does a castle stand for? Why is so much of it about eating and drinking? And why do they smash religious objects time and again? What is that about? I want to think about what issues keep coming up in the article. So I want to think about repetitions. And uh, what's very interesting is serfdom, um, the idea that freedom has been taken away. And that's really important. But my hunch is that's also to do with women's reproductive freedom. But I can go on about that later. I'm going to have to think about drums and banners. And finally, um, I'm going to have to think about the importance of oaths for subjectivity, why it is that the peasant war proceeds by people taking 
oaths to one another and creating bonds of trust. And finally, finally, I'm going to have to think about the landscape and the time of year because landscape, where you are, what your land is like, that is very much what is at stake uh, in the Peasants' War. So I'll stop there. Thank you.